Hello everyone. I am Dr. Midun Mohan, faculty in emergency medicine from Government Medical College, Kori Code. And along with my team, I would like to demonstrate how to manage the airway of a critically ill COVID patient. So if the patient is mildly hypoxemic, that is the saturation is between 88 to 94 percentage, but breathing rather comfortably, that is the patient is having only mild respiratory distress, then provide oxygen via a nasal cannula from 2 to 6 liters per minute which theoretically can increase the FiO2 to up to 40 percentage and then reassess your patient. If the saturation doesn't improve or it is somewhere in the range of 80 to 88 percentage, use a Hudson's mask with the flow of 6 to 10 liter per minute which theoretically can increase the FiO2 to up to 60 percentage and then reassess your patient. Now, if the patient doesn't improve or if the patient is really struggling and diaphoretic or the SATs are even lower than 80s, start with a non-rebreathing mask at 10 to 15 liters per minute or even higher which again theoretically can provide an FAO2 of up to 80 to 90 percentage to get your saturation to around 94 percentage and again reassess your patient. Why I say theoretically is that it depends on the flow demand of the patient. Patients with respiratory distress usually have high flow requirements of about 30 or 60 or even 120 liters per minute. So if we keep at 15 liters per minute on the flow meter, the rest of the air has to be entrained from the room air reducing the FiO2 by mixing. It is said that all the oxygen supplementation strategies is associated with the risk of aerosol generation and the risk increases as the flow you provide is increased. So always try to keep the flow as low as possible to maintain the saturation at about 94 percent each. Another thing which we should do is to provide all these patients with surgical masks. If they can tolerate it, to reduce the diffusion of aerosols. So a surgical mask should be kept over the nasal cannula or under the Hudson's or the non-rebreathing mask whichever you may be using and make sure to turn off the oxygen before you remove these masks off the face. Now if oxygen supplementation doesn't improve your oxygen saturation then it means that a lot of your patient's alveoli are collapsed. And the work that the patient is doing is not sufficient to open up these alveoli. The solution is to provide some sort of positive pressure continuously to open up the collapsed alveoli, otherwise called as recruitment. And to prevent the damaged alveoli from collapsing even at the end of expiration, providing something like a splinting effect. This continuous positive airway pressure or CPAP effect can be given either using a conventional CPAP machine through a non-invasive face mask interface or using a high flow nasal cannula. Usually when we place a patient on NIV, we prefer to use a vented mask. This is a mask with an exhalation port on the mask itself. But if you keep a COVID-19 patient on a vented mask, the problem is that a lot of aerosols are going to be released into the atmosphere. So in these patients, we are going to choose a non-vented NIV mask of appropriate size. To this, you need to attach your viral filter. Make sure that this is a viral filter and not an HME filter only. And after this, now you need to provide an extra expiratory port to which you can also attach your oxygen. And finally, this is attached to your single limb NIV circuit. This can help to prevent or reduce the dispersion of aerosols generated by non-invasive ventilation. Now apply the mask over the face. Hold it firmly over to the face and then attach the straps.
ensure that you have an adequate seal at the interface. High flow nasal oxygen therapy has several advantages over NIV. The interface is a nasal cannula which is much more tolerated by patients compared with the face mask of NIV. It provides warmed and humidified air which many NIV machines cannot. It can provide an FiO2 close to a hundred percentage because of the high flow of 40 to 60 liters per minute that it can generate. But the disadvantage is that the maximum CPAP or PEEP that it can generate is only about 5 cm water and that too depends on a lot of other things. So it's a fine option if I can recruit all the collapsed alveoli with such a minimal PEEP but if you require higher PEEP to recruit the alveoli and improve your oxygenation despite an FiO2 of 100% then HFNC is not a good option you have to go with a conventional CPAP and IV machine. Now, if your patient is having severe respiratory distress and is about to become fatigued or has already become fatigued and has gone into something called as a type 2 respiratory failure, but the patient is adequately conscious, then you need to support not only the oxygenation but the ventilation as well. That's where BiPAP may be provided using an NIV machine. Here the machine provides an IPAP, inspiratory positive airway pressure, during inspiration which is usually higher, about double than the EPAP which is expiratory positive airway pressure. This creates a pressure gradient called the driving pressure which drives a volume of air into the lungs because air always moves from a higher pressure to a lower pressure till both the pressures are equal. This volume of air can be increased by increasing the pressure gradient between the IPAP and the EPAP which we set in the machine. Now when it comes to COVID patients, these modes of non-invasive ventilation are not safe for the healthcare personnel. The high flow generated by these machines has the potential to produce a lot of aerosols, either from the expiratory port or from the interface leaks. The solution for this is of course use full PPEs, which I need not say anymore, airborne infection isolation rooms and modify the circuit to prevent the dispersion of aerosols. Instead of the usual vented mask which we use for the single limb NIV circuits, use a non-vented mask of appropriate size. Connect a bacterial viral filter. This is not your usual HMEs, these are different and you need to ask for viral filters specifically. Connect this between the mask and the expiratory port which is connected to your circuit. Another option is to use a ventilator and a separate expiratory limb. Make sure that you turn off the NIV machine before you remove the face mask. Now, what if the patient is too sick? His sensorium is poor, he is not making adequate breathing effort, he is not maintaining his airway and there is pooling of secretions in his mouth. Then you need to protect his airway as well by intubating him. Although the act of intubation is associated with the greatest risk of aerosol generation, once you intubate the patient using adequate precautions and inflate that cuff, it is associated with less aerosol dispersion compared to NIVs. Another thing you should realize is that these are not your pulmonary edema or COPD patients who respond well to your non-invasive ventilation and can be weaned off from them within a matter of hours or even a couple of days. Majority of these patients require ventilative support of an average of 7 days and delaying intubation in these patients may in fact cause more harm. So NIV may be used as a tool to buy us some time to get a ventilator or an ICU bed ready in those really sick patients with borderline hemodynamics. And it may be tried for longer duration only in selected population with mild to moderate symptoms and are relatively healthy without comorbidities and other organ involvement. 
Of course, you may use it if you reach at a stage where no ventilators are available. Many of you may be expert intubators, done hundreds of intubation. But what's going to challenge you while intubating a COVID patient are the physical and psychological stress of the infection control practices which you need to follow to keep yourself, your team members, as well as the other patients in your emergency department safe. On the other side, you may be a doctor without much expertise in airway management and you may come across a situation where you need to intubate a patient because nobody knows how long this pandemic is going to last and your hospital may not have the luxury to provide you with an expert intubator through all the shifts. So you also need to be prepared. Airway management is a skill and any skill can be learned only through practice. So we urge you to practice whatever we demonstrate here before venturing into the risky procedure of airway management of a critically ill COVID patient. Now the most important part coming to the principles of intubation in COVID patient. First and foremost is healthcare provider safety. How to ensure this? We can divide them into steps. First of all, steps to reduce contamination. Limit the number of people in the room to three. One intubator, one airway assistant, and one person for pushing the drugs and monitoring the vitals. Full PPEs, which includes N95 respirator, goggles, face shield, coveralls with hoods, or isolation gowns and cap. Shoe covers and double gloving is a must for all. Ensure that donning has been done correctly by yourself or better if checked by your teammate. Use video laryngoscopy, if available, to limit the proximity to the patient's mouth. Unlike direct laryngoscopy, where you need to look inside the patient's mouth. Once you're done with the procedure, place all the soiled equipment in double sealed biohazard bags so that no one will get further exposed to them. Proper doffing procedure with hand hygiene is a very crucial step, and it's always better to have someone coach you through the steps. The next most important step is to reduce the exposure time with the patient. For this, preparation is the most important thing. A dedicated intubation team with members who have been trained together using simulation exercises for this is highly desirable. A clear plan should be made and discussed. This includes the roles and responsibilities of the team members, the condition of the patient, and the backup plans if you encounter a difficult airway. Have a COVID-19 trickle intubation trolley that can be used in the emergency department, ICU, or elsewhere prepared. Use a checklist to make sure that all the necessary equipments are available and functional before entering the room. Try to get the intubation done in the first try itself. Repeated attempts increases the exposure time as well as may harm the patient. So it's highly recommended that the most experienced and skilled intubator should attempt the procedure. Giving a muscle relaxant during your rapid sequence intubation facilitates first pass success. Next most important step is to minimize aerosol generation and its dispersion. Early intubation is preferred instead of non-invasive ventilation or high-flow nasal oxygen. If you have to use them, make appropriate modifications. Intubate in a negative pressure room if available. Alternatives we have mentioned in the previous lecture. Rapid sequence intubation with a higher dose of paralytic agent is the method of choice. This ensures apnea because even the air that the patient exhales is contaminated with viral droplets. It prevents cuff while laryngoscopy and intubation. And finally, it relaxes all your airway muscles, including the vocal cords, which makes the procedure easier. Post-pressure ventilation, high flow oxygen, and manual bagging should be done only if clinically necessary. Always use viral filters when doing these procedures. 
inflate the tube cuff before positive pressure ventilation limit ventilator disconnections now rapid sequence intubation it can be divided into seven piece of rsi as we call it it includes preparation pre-oxygenation pre-medication paralysis with induction positioning placement of tube and post intubation management let's go through each of these steps in detail Preparation in this case has to be done outside the airborne infection isolation room. This includes donning your PPEs and body check. Drugs and equipment preparation. Drugs include pre-medication drugs, induction drugs, paralytic drugs and post-intubation sedation and analgesia drugs. Draw them into syringes and mark the syringes. Discuss the roles and responsibilities the condition of the patient and your backup plans for a difficult airway. Now let's see how it's done. Hi, I am Dr. Kavita, emergency physician. Please, please introduce yourself. I'm Dr. Arshad Fazal, I'm also an emergency physician. I'm Dr. Agil, I'm also an emergency physician. Oh, so in our team, Dr. Arshad is the most senior person among us, so he will be the intubator. Okay. Um, and Dr. Agil, you can be the airway assistant sure, and I will be Dr. team leader. As well as I will be dealing with the drug side. I will monitor the patient also. Okay. Uh, so let's move on to our body check. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Dr. Akhil, will you please adjust your... Oh, sure. Sorry, Dr. Is it all right? Yeah, now it's all right. Oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, so we have a patient, 35-year-old male patient. He's a cold positive patient with ARDS. And uh, as of now, his hemodynamic status is stable. But okay. uh, he needs airway assistance as well as he needs ICU care. Okay. Sure. So for that we have to check, uh, let's move to check our intubation for the yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have a modified bag and mask device with viral filters, catheter mount and peep valve attached to it. And we can initially plan for a video laryngoscopy assisted intubation if we fail. Uh, we can uh, go for second generation uh, supraglottic airway device with an eye gel. Or uh, if we come across a situation of can't intubate, can't ventilation situation, we can go for a front of neck access. And all the necessary drugs are being drawn and loaded in the syringe. So, okay, doctors, are there any concerns? No, we are ready. No. Okay, so we are good to go, okay? Yeah, sure. Once you enter the room, assess the situation and touch as little as possible to avoid formites. The intubator should be at the head end, the airway assistant to his right, and the team leader who also administers the medications as well as monitors to the left. A quick assessment of the airway may be done to look for possible difficult airway. Identify the cricothyroid membrane as well. Ensure two functional intravenous access. Next step is pre-oxygenation. For this, first turn off the oxygen. Remove the NRBM mask as well as the face mask by cutting them off. and disposing them properly. Apply a nasal cannula initially. And set a flow of 6 liters per minute. This can provide apneic oxygenation as well as apneic CPAP. Use a back mass ventilation device with a viral filter and a flexible catheter mount to provide leverage and a peep valve if available between the mask and the back. Use a firm two-handed VE grip to prevent any leak. A non-vented NIV mask of optimum size may be used to achieve a better seal. Now keep the flow of at least 15 liter per minute. The adequacy of the flow may be assessed by looking at the reservoir back 
it should not collapse during inspiration. Avoid bagging as far as possible. A low pressure bagging technique may be used at 6 to 10 breaths per minute if the patient has poor respiratory effort. If the patient is agitated due to hypoxia, preoxygenation may be done after giving 0.5 to 1 mg per kilogram of ketamine or 0.01 to 0.03 mg per kilogram of midazolam depending on the hemodynamic status of the patient. Patient may be positioned in a rammed up position to facilitate preoxygenation as well as intubation if desired. Preoxygenation in this way should be continued for 3 to 5 minutes depending on the condition of the patient. Next step is paralysis with induction. Induction of unconsciousness and complete paralysis before laryngoscopy is highly recommended to prevent coughing by the patient and inadvertent exposure of the healthcare provider. This also facilitates first pass success of tracheal intubation. Ketamine 1 to 2 mg per kg or etomidate 0.15 to 0.3 mg per kilogram are the preferred induction agents. Consider giving a lower dose if the patient is having borderline or unstable hemodynamics. Have a vasopressor like push dose epinephrine 0.1 to 0.5 mg ready to manage post intubation hypotension if it develops. Succinylcholine 1.5 mg to 2 mg per kg or rocuronium 1.5 mg per kg are the preferred paralytic agents. Wait for at least 45 seconds to 1 minute for the paralytic agents to take effect before attempting intubation. Sedation only intubation or awake fibroptic intubation should be avoided. Patient may be positioned in the sniffing position after induction and neuromuscular blockade. If available, an aerosol box may be kept over the patient to prevent further aerosol dispersal. Turn off the oxygen before removing the back mask device. This helps to reduce aerosolization. A video laryngoscope assisted intubation is preferable to conventional laryngoscopy to reduce the risk of exposure. Intubate with a 6.5 to 7.5 mm internal diameter ET tube in females and 7.5 to 8.5 mm internal diameter ET tube in males. Cover the adapter of the tube using a ghost pad to prevent splashing of secretions while removing the stillet or the bucci. Do not check the position of the tube without inflating the pilot balloon with 10 ml of air and attaching a viral filter to the ET tube adapter. If a standalone mechanical ventilator or transport ventilator is immediately available, connect the ET tube with the viral filter attached to it to the ventilator and avoid using a manual restator or ambu bag. A closed suction should be pre-connected to the ventilator circuit if available. Continuous waveform capnography, if available, is recommended to confirm tracheal tube position initially. Bedside ultrasound may also be used for the same. The physician should then exclude bronchial intubation by 5-point auscultation or a chest x-ray. Carefully remove the aerosol box after this. The ET tube should be fixed at about 20 to 21 centimeter length in females and about 23 centimeters length in males. Now the final step of rapid sequence intubation is post intubation sedation and analgesia. This is very important. If endotracheal intubation by an experienced intubator fails after achieving adequate patient relaxation and proper positioning, then ventilate the patient after inserting an appropriate size supraglottic airway device like 
a laryngeal mask airway or an eye gel device if available. Now, if you face a can't intubate, can't oxygenation, something we called as CICO situation, proceed with emergency front of neck access. It can be done with procedures like surgical cricothyrotomy. One of the team members or a person with full PPE who waits outside the room should have the expertise for e fauna if this situation arises. Communicate clearly. Simple instructions, closed loop communication, adequate volume without shouting is essential. Place a nasogastric tube after tracheal intubation is completed and ventilation established safely. If COVID-19 status has not been already confirmed, then take a deep tracheal aspirate for virology using a closed suction. Closed suction if available is preferred for clearing the tracheal tube compared to open suctioning. Discard disposable equipment safely after use. Decontaminate reusable equipment fully and according to manufacturer's instructions. After leaving the room, ensure doffing of PP is meticulous and coached by a teammate. Clean the room 60 minutes after tracheal intubation or last aerosol generating procedure. Now to summarize, healthcare provider safety is the first priority. Do not rush in without proper preparation even if the patient is really sick. Prepare to do CPR as well. Take precautions to reduce aerosolization at every step. RSI with complete paralysis is the method of choice for intubation. COVID specific simulation based learning as teams can help to prepare better and reduce errors. Thank you.